Oh, hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Business Alchemy. This is your host, Angela Johnson, and I'm really excited for my guest today, Stephen Ledbetter, also known as Stevo or Coach Stevo, so we'll call him Stevo <laughs> for this episode. I'm really excited that we're here. I was the guest on your podcast where I revealed my, you know, re- leaving my religion experience and what that was like. Um, yeah, not many a, people get me to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice, casual, light conversation. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, <laughs> nothing, nothing, no big deal or anything like that. Um, well, welcome. You know, I am fascinated with everything that you're creating, you know, betterish.co where you help people who know that they need to do something, but they're just not doing it. And you have developed a body of work called motivation science. And mm-hmm. so let's mm-hmm. just maybe start there of, you know, how did you get into this? You know, you also assist startups, um, you're a consultant for startups. So you have multiple things that you do, which I love multifaceted entrepreneur, um, so how did you start doing all of this? Um, um, about 10 years ago, uh, well, actually it's probably, no, it's longer than that now. Um, I was, I got laid off, uh, and I think, I think a lot of origin stories start with getting laid off, but, um, <laughs> 2008, right. That's the housing yeah. market was crashing. Oh, good. Yeah. Me too. Got it. <laughs> yeah. And I told my my parents that I was going to do something very different that they were very surprised by. Um, I told them I wanted to be an officer in the United States Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. Um, And they were a little shocked. I I, I I went to Harvard and the University of Chicago. I have no military history in my background. And, well, my family has no military history. And as far as they had seen, they'd never seen me express any interest in it. But mm-hmm. um, it was something that I had wanted to do specifically because, and this is weird to say, everything else had been easy. Um, I'm a, I'm pretty good at talking. And I'd managed to do a lot of things in my life that, and, and still, and, and never really been challenged. Um, and more importantly, I'd done it all without really feeling like it had a sense of purpose, without mm-hmm. really feeling like I was doing anything for anyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I went down to the Berkeley Officer Selection Office. I applied to be a Marine officer and then spent the next 14 months waiting on a tattoo waiver, uh, <laughs> which is it like puts the brakes on on a lot of momentum when you have mm-hmm. to sit around and wait for yeah. approval to move on to the next step in your life for 14 months. Mm-hmm. But in that process, I started working with the other officer candidates because around that time, I had also lost about 60 pounds in order to do this. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the other candidates were asking me how to lose weight. So I started helping them. And it was the first time that I really was a coach. It was mm-hmm. the first time that I was actually helping other people. Um, but it was also incredibly misleading because – Marine Corps officer candidates are pretty much the easiest people in the world to get people to get them to do stuff. Yeah, just, they ask and then you tell them and then they do it. It's mm-hmm. really easy. Yeah. Um, but after that uh, didn't work out the way that I hoped, um, and I had to, but I had fallen in love with this process of helping people, and even more so helping people that were wanted to go on to help other people. So mm-hmm. that kind of started the the, the mission of my personal mission is to help the most people help the most people. Mm-hmm. And that kind of is where that started to, to come about. But my first interaction out after that was I was like, Oh, I can help regular people lose weight. Mm-hmm. The general pop, the civilians. And my first paying client um, came to me in, in the gym that I was hanging out at, hoping that people would ask me if I was a personal trainer uh, and luckily she did. She assumed that I was, and she asked me if I could help her. She said, my doctor says I need to lose 15 pounds. So I did what I did with the Marine Corps officer candidates. I said, great, here's what to do. And mm-hmm. she's looked at me like I was insane and said, uh, yeah, I know all that. I know what to do. I can't make myself do it. Mm. And then I realized that even though I had all these certifications and stuff, I I didn't have the most basic tools in the toolkit for actually helping people. Um, And so I, that set me on a path to graduate school for health psychology, um, Mm -hmm. for finding out more and more about um, the, the actual uh, stuff that we know as a motivation, as a science uh, motivation Mm -hmm. of what, what 
is now called self determination theory um, and a, a host of number a number of other theories and teaching coaches more about all the these the answers to basic questions like how do I how do I help people change mm-hmm. um, and that's sort of led me on this path now teaching that to coaches teaching it to product managers at startup companies and uh, developers and UX designers and stuff like that. Mm, awesome. Wow. So who'd have known that, you know, waiting for a tattoo waiver would have mm-hmm. to be on this path? Like, <laughs> I mean, that's it's re- the first time I've ever heard something like that. So <laughs> that's pretty incredible. So when yeah. you talk about self-determination theory, because, you know, mm-hmm. I, I see this, you know, with the business clients that I have, you know, who are starting businesses and it's like, we have our list of things to do. I do it myself. Of, I know what I should be doing. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, I'm not doing it. And there's always a reward for not doing it. And so is it that simple of just like the reward for not doing it is bigger than the reward for doing it? Or I, I have a feeling it's a lot deeper than that. But what is yeah. self-determination theory? Uh, self-determination theory is about uh, – its origins are about 40 years old. Um, it started in the work in the 70s um, by two gentlemen by the name of Rich Ryan and Ed DC, who are at, at University of Rochester, um, who – and – they ask a pretty basic question. Why does it, why does the, the, my motivation to go to work feel different than my motivation to play with my children? Mm. If mo- cause up until the seventies researchers had always thought of motivation as just something you had or you hadn't, or you mm-hmm. didn't have, or mm-hmm. maybe it varied in degree, but no one ever thought to investigate if, if there were different kinds of motivation, if motivation could vary in what's called quality. Mm. And through their research, they found a lot of really interesting things, um, and that culminated in the uh, this theory called self determination theory, that basically says that human beings are naturally inclined to learn, to grow, and to master ambient challenges in their environment. If there are certain conditions that are being met, social conditions, um, and these are called the basic psychological needs. If you are in an environment where you perceive that you uh, are being your 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 um, desire for autonomy is being supported, your desire for competence, and your desire for belonging or relatedness is supported. Mm-hmm. Then these are what they'll call these nutriments. If they're met, then you will naturally be inclined to be curious, to explore your environment, to try to learn, and most importantly, to do stuff. To actually get mm-hmm. up off the couch and do things. So. Within this is called a positive motivational climate, and we're surrounded by it, there's, there's you're not just in, ever in ever in one you're in lots of pockets, and as you move through these pockets of positive motivational climates, you start to take on the motivations, beliefs, and and identities of these positive motivational climates, and that's what we call this emotion of motivation. Um, and that process takes place over time. Uh, it actually takes about nine to 12 months of slowly integrating this identity into a new sense of self. Mm-hmm. And that is a very, it's a very rich, complicated mechanism, but mm-hmm. it's so much more, it explains so much more and it has so much more depth than just a simple rewards and punishment system. Yeah. Rewards and punishments are a are a part of that, but they are barely even the top snowflake on the tip of the iceberg mm. of how deep this incredibly universal human emotion goes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love this. Um, you know, I was having a conversation yesterday with someone and I was just noticing some people around me that I was like, I don't know that I enjoy being around them so much anymore. Mm-hmm. I was like, what is this? Like, what is going on? And, and the only thing I could just, you know, that I was noticing was just like, they're not creating anything. And I know that could sound like a totally judgmental, you know, thing. Like think what you, it would think what you think, but it was like they're it's not inspiring. It's like they're not mm-hmm. creating anything. It's it's they're not actually doing something. And where I'm constantly changing things and dreaming up things, envisioning, and where am I going to travel next? And like what like what am I going to do and make and create and put my hands on and you know, yeah. And and I was just like, huh, what like what is this? But I was noticing this pattern of like it's just kind of this just like what you're describing. And I'm just looking at these, you know, the um, competence, the sense of belonging, Mm -hmm. um, autonomy, like, huh, that's really fascinating. Like if those are not in the environment, then where can you really do anything different? Yeah. You start to shut down. Yeah. You start to 
start to give this sense of why should I even try? Uh-huh. And one of my favorite exercises to get people to think about how powerful this is, is think of your favorite teacher, the teacher that had the biggest impact on your life and how they made you feel and mm-hmm. what they did to make you feel that way. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And most people want to ask in this report without using the words autonomy, competence, belonging, perhaps will, will say things that are like that. They made me feel like uh, they were interested in me, which is mm-hmm. a classic support for autonomy. They made mm-hmm. me feel like I could do it, which is a classic support for competence. And they made me feel like they liked me. Even mm-hmm. if, even if it wasn't like my, one of my uh, examples that comes up a lot when I do this with uh, with men is that they'll say like a football coach. They say, well, he didn't hug me or anything. It's like, but did you think he liked you? And they say, like, yeah, like mm-hmm. an uncon- a kind of an unconditional positive regard is what yeah. um, uh, the, the, the fancy psychological term um, <laughs> is from Carl Rogers. But, the, but then I think an even faster way to think about it is, what about your least favorite teacher or your worst teacher? Mm-hmm. How did they make you feel? And it's usually wow. the opposite. It's, it's yep. isolated, controlled, and stupid. Mm. And that is a classic, uh, a motivational climate. Um, a, or we, we call the, but we, the example we use is, is a hot tub. When you're in a hot tub, everything feels fun and exciting. Uh, and that's what we think a positive motivational climate feels like. But as soon as mm-hmm. someone throws ice in that hot tub, you want to get out and that's yeah. what thwarting those basic psychological needs. As soon as you feel stupid or judged or like someone doesn't like you or that someone's trying to manipulate or control you, mm-hmm. all bets are off. Like it's yes. just, it's just gross. Yeah. Well, here's another, I'm just having this fascination right now of, you know, the mm-hmm. humanitarian work I've done in Kenya. I've been studying um, their motivation to create something different. And, um, mm-hmm. and it's really interesting. A bunch of people come into these communities like, this is what you should do. And this is the better way to live. And they're like, no, I just want to <laughs> like have a job and send my kids to school. Like, yeah. I, I don't need this, the water well, like we're actually fine with the water we have. It's really fascinating, but just noticing where these components are not present for most of these communities that I've at least seen. And, and it makes, you know, cause I've just been looking at like the scarcity mindset versus mm-hmm. knowing that what they're creating today can last a generation. Like they're just, they don't think that way. Cause they're focused on like, I just got to feed my babies tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Like that's what my focus is, but you know, they don't, have these these core pieces so it's like hi i'm wondering you know the psychological component of it's not just about building a school or a water well it's what kind of environment can be created or assisted or you know expanded whatever word you want to use that Mm -hmm. would assist the thinking process of what's possible versus just trying to get by what's interesting is that there's a lot of um Older psychological theories that people might have heard of, for example, Maslow's hierarchy of needs mm-hmm. is something that a lot of people know about. Yeah. That self-determination theory is becoming so um, – it's like it's like the Borg slowly taking over every other psychological yeah. theory um, because it does such a good job of predicting and explaining human behavior. Mm-hmm. And uh, they, one of the – I can't I'm, – I'm, I'm kicking myself um, that I don't have Omar, my head of research on the phone too, uh, to, <laughs> to tell me what this study was, but it was a study and done. It was, it was South Africa where they w- were trying to figure out if um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs uh, explained behavior more than the basic psychological needs theory. Mm. And when they went to a pla- two places, one that had a high crime rate and one that had a low crime rate. And they found mm. that when you actually interviewed people and talked to them, People's perception that they were uh, being controlled by their fear and by the fear of of dying mm-hmm. was having more of a negative social impact than the actual stress. That, 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 that was the cause of it, not the actual violence itself. So mm-hmm. um, it's kind of a weird way to think about things. But in a situation like a scarcity mindset, a scarcity mindset from a self determination theory perspective is a feeling that you are being, that you are not in control, that you don't have autonomy uh-huh. and because you have a lack of resources. Um, and weirdly enough, what some of the, the most effective ways to create that sense of perception of autonomy is to just come in and ask people and talk to people and listen to people, mm-hmm. not to be prescriptive at all. 
in fact, just to listen. Mm -hmm. Ask questions, listen, Mm -hmm. and truly listen. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I I saw that um, with different groups. You know, I remember um, staying in this, this place, you know, I was there, we were building a school and just having this, you know, incredible experience. And there was a group there, they were doing mission work and, and they, um, they were there to build a school and it was all around their, their religion and their church and, you know, nothing wrong with that necessarily. Um, Mm -hmm. but they weren't asking this community what they wanted. And it was like, Mm -hmm. this is what we're going to do. And we're going to help you feed your kids and send your kids to school. And, and what we did is we built this relationship, especially the, the founder of this group, you know, built this, you know, 20 year relationship with this community and asked them, what do you want? Mm -hmm. Like, how can we contribute to you? Mm-hmm. What's next for you? Like, what do you think is going to be the thing that changes your community and this particular community? And it's pretty common is, you know, education. We've got to educate our kids. Mm-hmm. And so it was just such a different vibe. I just remember sitting there going, this is so different. And what, like, what is the difference? And now I can look back and go, well, one of us was asking questions and the other was prescribing. Yeah. Uh, I, Rich Ryan sums, summarizes it as working with, not doing to. Ah, yeah. Yeah. You're yeah. coming in with a mindset and then, truly deep listening and actually actually listening to someone um and i forgot who i'm getting this from but uh, uh the way that i think about whenever i'm working with someone is truly deep listening beings means being open to changing your own mind mm. and i think that that's that's why it's so hard to actually do it's why i know we work when we work with um coaches and and uh, designers and stuff we spend months teaching the mindset of working with not doing to. Mm-hmm. And uh, John Marshall Reeves, who did uh, all of the, the fantastic research to teach how to teach this, um, who does all these, he's these huge, huge interventions teaching teachers how to be autonomy supportive. Uh, he says that it takes about a year, <laughs> about a year to learn to be nat- to 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 learn the habits of autonomy support but the funny thing is once someone learns how to work with instead of doing to they never go back and because it works so much better and wow. they're really confused why other people aren't doing it naturally <laughs> because it works so well and they forget that it took them a year to learn it yeah yeah wow so this whole concept of you know it takes 21 days to change a habit um is that mm-hmm. bullshit yeah, it is. Um, it, well, actually, it's worse. It's the worst kind of bullshit because it's about ten percent right. Um, uh, the best studies done that we have on habit was called habit automaticity: how long it takes something to become automatic, which is the true mm. definition of a habit, uh, is when it no longer requires effort and when it is taking place subconsciously. Um, mm. That has shown that it takes a range. Of 18 to 264 days to wow. become a habit. And it all, it's all dependent. The only thing that matters is repeating it in context, making sure that you repeat the habit in the exact same environment that you are in every time, mm. um, which is hard. That's really yeah. hard to do. So, yeah. uh, the average is 66 days, but the average is so, like, the standard deviation is so huge that that, that number is meaningless. So, yeah. Please don't think that it's 66. It's anywhere from 18 <laughs> to 254. And that, it, it basically is way longer than you want it to be. It's way longer than you want it to be. And it's really hard to know if it's automatic because by definition, a habit is subconscious. So it's yeah. really hard to know when it's become subconscious. Well, and it makes perfect sense though. I mean, when you, you know, use the example of weight loss, um, mm-hmm. just like, you know, this whole 21 day and I remember buying into it and just like, that's just not like, there's something, there must be something wrong with me because I've been doing this shit for 21 days and it's yeah. not changing. Like I still hate doing this every day. I thought it was going to be different. It was supposed to be different. That's what I, that was the big sexy promise I bought into. Mm-hmm. So that is fascinating. No wonder why like weight loss industry is how many billion dollar industry. Well, I think the, I think the, the secret the secret to the fact that the weight loss industry is a how many billion dollar industry is something you said in that story, which is I thought something was wrong with me. Uh huh. I love that. Like if you, I love that how nefarious that is. If you bought a TV and the TV didn't work, would you say, I guess there's something wrong with me? <laughs> no, you'd be mad at the people that made the goddamn TV. Like oh. when it doesn't work, it doesn't mean you're broken. It means that the thing wasn't the right fit. Uh. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that is, that's my, I, and I do it too. This is not like a thing that I, everyone falls for this. 
Everyone mm-hmm. falls for it when, when there's so many industries that are billed as moral and not logical. Yeah. Um, and like there's good foods and bad foods. There's good ways to do business and bad ways to do business. There's mm-hmm. good things. and bad. Like, If things are being sold that way, it's really easy to think that if you did it wrong, it's because you're a bad person mm, instead yeah. of thinking, oh, that wasn't the right fit or uh, this wasn't the right time in my life or I wasn't being supported in the right way. Mm. Um, that's one of my favorite things about having been steeped so much in this motivation science literature is that it changes the way you think about a lot of stuff. Mm. And now when I'm struggling to do something, I've got this little toolkit to kind of assess the situation and go, am I, are, are my basic psychological needs being supported by this endeavor? It, did I yeah. set this up right? Is this the right time in my life? Is this really a priority? And I think yeah. the most, the hardest question of all, do I really want this? Mm-hmm. Sometimes the answer is no. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I, I, I should want it or it would be cool to have that. It's what mm-hmm. I'm supposed to do, but deep down, I'm like, I actually don't care about this. Yeah. In self-termination theory, the word should's really special. Um, mm-hmm. Should implies that you are, um, you have begun to internalize an external motivation. Mm-hmm. Um, and should means someone else told me this. So I'm, and I want to be like them or I want yep. to avoid being like them. And this is what I think I need to do, but I don't actually believe it yet. Uh. And, and should means that you're being motivated by guilt and shame. Hmm. Uh, what, what it's, the literature is referred to as introjected motivation, which even sounds bad. Introjection sounds painful. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reality is that it is a type of motivation. It does get us to do stuff, but at a cost, it, it mm-hmm. feels gross and icky. And over time we start to react against it if we don't find new reasons to, to love something. Mm-hmm. And that's one of my, when I was a personal trainer, I noticed pretty quickly that people saying they should lose weight doesn't really last past the first beer. <laughs> yeah. And after that, all bets are off. Um, yeah. Or, or in my case, glass of wine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And there's yep. nothing wrong with should. It's just that if that's the only thing that's motivating you, it's, it's a great trigger to look at what else about the thing that you want. Do you actually want? Yeah. What yeah. is, what makes you feel like you'll be a better version of yourself and really focus on those qualities and what you can do to build those qualities. Maybe it's losing weight, but more importantly, maybe it's just eating vegetables <laughs> or mm-hmm. um, eating a little bit less, uh, uh, moving more. Maybe it's none of those things. It doesn't it, it, because as soon as you try to judge those things, you'll actually end up feeling less motivated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So in the work that I teach, you know, we talk about just the energetic component of when you judge something, it locks it in a place and it's impossible mm-hmm. to change. Like what we judge, we cannot change. Mm-hmm. And I always use that example of, you know, ladies, how long, how many decades have you been judging your thighs? Have they changed? Like mm-hmm. judgment, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I think this guilt and shame piece is such a critical com- component as well, because when they look at, you know, the causes, whether it's building a school in Africa or, uh, you know, the political, whatever you want to think call it in the U S mm-hmm. right now, just like all these things of where people are trying to use motivation through guilt and shame of like, you should care about this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And like, there's a reason why it's not changing. There's a reason why it's not working. And so to get people on board for your cause, and this is just my own point of view here, mm-hmm. like through guilt and shame, it's like, that doesn't work. And it doesn't feel good. I remember, you know, someone uh, years ago asked me to donate, you know, cause I'm the quote six figure business owner and I have all this apparently, you know, piles of cash under my mattress. And she's <laughs> like, you know, you should just donate and, and support this cause and you should do this. And there was a lot of guilt and shame. And I was like, why does this feel so crappy other than, you know, it's a really lousy way to actually <laughs> get people to donate yeah, yeah. for your cause. Yeah, but it was yeah. something deeper than that. It was just like, yeah, I, I'm not actually never going to donate to something where there's guilt and shame involved. Mm-hmm. Like it's gotta be from a different, different perspective for me. And so is that, I mean, it's similar to kind of what you're talking about. It's like, if we're really wanting to create change here, but we're using guilt, shame as a way to motivate or the shoulds to motivate, mm-hmm. then there's a reason why these issues, whatever the issue is, isn't having long-term change. It can, mm-hmm. um, I'm going to, I'm going to say yes, yes. And to that, mm-hmm. uh, Yes, guilt and shame doesn't work over the long term. There's some mm-hmm. stuff that doesn't need to be changed over the long term that is mm-hmm. short. And that, mm-hmm. and weirdly mm-hmm. enough, guilt and shame actually works 
when something's when, when you only need like a little bit uh. um, because there's not much negative repercussion. However, um, most hard things are hard because they take a long time. Mm. And if you're talking about changing anything over a long, a long haul, then guilt and shame might be what gets people in the door. Uh. But as soon as you start working with someone, as soon as you start thinking about how are we going to keep doing this, judgment's got to go out the window. There can be no judgment when someone comes in that door. Mm. Um, and this is, a, and I guess I need to use an example for something that's short for guilt and shame. Um, mm. Safety things. Safety things, there's like a really short intervention that most people just need to get their attention real quick. Mm -hmm. And you need to make sure that they understand that what they're about to do is dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, when if, if I'm in a gym and someone is lifting weights in a way that is not safe, I need to get their attention very quickly. I might say something to them that I would not say calmly mm -hmm. to someone who was talking to me about their thighs. I might say something like, hey, idiot, don't do that. <laughs> and then come over to them and give them like, and then have like a, a, a conversation that mm -hmm. is not judging, but I just need to get them to not do something in mm -hmm. the moment. That's the time when guilt and shame might be okay. But oh my God, there's only like four of those times in a day. Like everything <laughs> else needs to be gentle and calm and kind. So I, mm -hmm. that's just my, my, yeah. I, it, the, it depends answer. I can't not say it depends. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's definitely the minority, the extreme yeah. minority with guilt and shame is actually helpful. Yeah. Well, and I'm just, you know, thinking about like fear based selling where it mm -hmm. might not be like guilt and shame, but it's so interesting. It's like, you know, there's that immediate like, oh, yeah, this is going to work. And then the letdown happens after because that yeah. initial kind of reaction is over. But the sustainability, longevity of it, it can't keep being motivated by that. And again, guilt and shame is yeah. probably not exactly the right words, but there's an element to that when I look at the coaching industry and a lot of the fear-based selling tactics that are out totally. there. Totally. I think it's, I think you're, you're onto something. I think it's mostly guilt and shame. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's some identity stuff in there, but it's more being dangled as something that you're not worthy of. Yeah. Like become worthy of this identity. It's like, mm -hmm. mm, that's just guilt. Like that's just shame <laughs> for not having already had that identity. Like let's be real. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so there's another example, you know, we we're talking about these components of, you know, what it really takes someone to thrive. Um, and, you know, in a lot of the startups, especially that I work with marketing, getting their first clients and things that way, um, there's oftentimes a lot of shame when people say, you know what, I can't do this like exactly this way. I've got to go get a job. And what's fascinating is once they get the job, their business starts growing. Mm -hmm. Because that those basic needs, I think that those basic needs have been covered. So there's not that the scarcity, there's not like whatever that is. Um, is this, I mean, is a similar example just applied in a different way or what are your thoughts about that? Um, um, I would, that, I'd say there's definitely something to that. Um, I would say that the, the major thing that's happening there is that their sense of competence is being um, mm -hmm. rewarded and they're in an environment where they're, they're actually accomplishing things because there's more structure that's one of the key ways to create um, an environment where people feel competent is to provide a structure that shows them that it, when they do things, they get feedback that they're actually good at it. So uh -huh. when you're an entrepreneur, you spend all day alone in your house, not really being told that you're being, you're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. You go out and you get a job where other people are giving you feedback, even if it's just like, Oh, thanks for getting me that coffee. That starts mm -hmm. to have knock on effects. And there's another uh, psychological theory called, uh, social cognitive theory that that is, talks about self-efficacy. You're how confident you are that you can perform a task. Well, how mm -hmm. confident you are you can perform a task uh, goes up the more you see other people doing it, mm -hmm. and it also goes up the more you do it. Mm -hmm. So you have these two things kind of working together, which is I'm getting lots of feedback. I'm feeling a lot more global confidence mm -hmm. that I can do anything. And therefore, I start doing more things because I'm not worried about being judged for it. And there's a structure. There's a structure for actually getting feedback. Yeah. So, and I think the person who summarized this the most is Mark Twain. Uh, <laughs> summarized the best. Uh, he said, if you want to get something done, ask a busy person. <laughs> yes. And it's mm -hmm. totally true. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the more you're doing, the more you think you can do. It's yeah. a weird 
thing until you know, obviously it's a diminishing more return. But mm -hmm. the the fact of the matter is starting something is incredibly hard because there's no structure. So there's no way to know if you're getting good at it. So you're not getting competence feedback. So it's an, and yeah. I, one of my mottos is if you can, if someone can assume they're incompetent, they will. And oh yes, and most of us are operating in a feedback vacuum. We have no idea if we're getting better at something, so mm -hmm. we assume we're bad at it. Yeah. Oh, okay. There are a couple questions I have from this, but before we do that, we're going to go to break for just about a minute. And so when we come back, I have some questions around how do you start something, especially when it's so stinking hard. So sure. we'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. This is Angela Johnson, your host of Business Alchemy, and I have Coach Steve-O as my awesome guest today. And we're talking about how 21 days, you know, it's a bullshit <laughs> of how to change a habit. Like, if you do it for 21 days, it's going to change. And really what's required to create change. And mm -hmm. before we had the break, we talked about business owners who are starting something and it feels really hard, you know, and I'm just seeing like this is really eye opening for me, Steve. -O, so I'm just so grateful and appreciative of this conversation, because as I've been studying entrepreneurs and why some people succeed, why some people don't, why some people get results, why some people don't. And one of the things that I've been saying for a couple of years, I said, if you're if your confidence is is pretty lousy. And just ask yourself, when's the last time you actually did what you loved? Like, are you doing the admin stuff and all this other stuff? Because when you see yourself, like for me, when I'm working with a client or when I'm doing something that I, I love and time just flies by, it's really amazing that my confidence increases. And it's like I can see myself doing something. I'm like, oh, I'm actually pretty good at this. <laughs> but if it's been a while since I've seen myself do that, then that's where I get really in my head and I start making up all sorts of lovely stories about maybe I should do this. Maybe I should just, you know, braid people's hair on the beach <laughs> in Mexico as my, as my job. Like maybe, you know, and it's just so funny that this, this up and down cycle for, for entrepreneurs, if you're not actually doing the work and not getting that feedback that you're doing a good job, it would make sense that you really get in your own way. Yeah. yeah. I was talking to a just, wildly smart person the other day named Julie uh, Dickerson who uh, does, creates t really huge teaching interventions um, like a, you know, a big construction company. I mean like Caterpillar or something will hire her to say, we want to end job fatalities. How do we teach workers to not have accidents? You know, like big multi-year questions like that. Mm -hmm. Um I, I made up Caterpillar. That wasn't, she doesn't work for Caterpillar. I don't know that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was just by example. And she said that most of her job is not designing co uh, content. It's designing feedback. It's designing oh, wow. how do we get feedback to people? Because mm -hmm. every type of learning depends on feedback, whether you're, you have a knowledge gap, a habit gap, a skills gap. They all require feedback to let you know you're on the right track. And I think that entrepreneurs are operating in a feedback vacuum all the time. Yeah. And one of the only things we have to let us know that we're on the right track of something is the feeling that we're doing something we love, which is a type of feedback that's real. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's intuitive, but that doesn't mean it's not real. Yeah. And uh, I, and funnily enough, that very suggestion that you made, when was the last time that you did something you love, is almost verbatim what – at DC, Rich Ryan or one of the tens of thousands of self formation theory researchers would say mm. is thinking about why you love something is one of the fastest ways to connect with it. It's one of the fastest ways yeah. to get your motivation back on something is mm -hmm. just asking yourself, why do I love this? Or what about this do I love? Or what did I love? If you don't remember, <laughs> mm. uh, if, you, if you're not feeling in love with it in the moment. Um, yeah. And then trying to create some way to reflect on that. That's structured some way, whether it's journaling, just asking yourself a question at the end of the day, uh, some way to get to talk to yourself or better yet with another person, maybe mm -hmm. another person that loves it too, and just talk about it. It doesn't have to be any more structured than that, yeah. but just some way to get feedback built into your system. Mm-hmm. So when you say structure, you've used that a couple of times and you use mm -hmm. just a couple of examples of journaling. So you can actually like there's a structure of like you see yourself kind of writing it black and white, use a piece of paper, talking mm -hmm. with someone. Tell me a little bit more about structure, because my brain goes to like it has to be very structured and organized and 
And that's where I'm like, oh, that doesn't sound very fun. Um, but what is yeah. that context of structure? Uh, I'm using structure in a kind of a loose way, but but it's actually I'm thinking of it more of the definition from the literature. Structure, <laughs> and my way I'm using it is a way to get feedback on a regular basis. Mm. Um, so structure can mean something very rigid. And when something's a, when someone's a beginner, that type of super rigid structure is very helpful. And when they're working with a coach, that's most what the coach does. They expose them to, they give them a path that's very rigid so that they can get lots of quick feedback about their competence. Um, mm. And then as they gain expertise, the coach slowly takes that structure away. In teaching, that's called scaffolding. Um, the goal here is to let someone, someone who's new, feel like there is a, that they can get better. The perception that you can get better if you put in the work is the core understanding of competence. Mm. Um, if you do not know that you can get better, it feels chaotic and chaos feels controlling because there's no way to know mm. if you're getting better at something or not. Uh, example I use a lot is if you had a, if you, if your doctor told you that you had stage four cancer and then you said, what do I do? And they said, do whatever you want. That doesn't <laughs> feel helpful. It feels controlling from mm -hmm. a being withholding of, of structure or withholding of a plan. So you're trying to counteract the chaos that exists. If you're an entrepreneur, you're in, you're on it, you're in it by yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to give yourself some way of getting regular feedback, and that's what I mean by structure. And mm -hmm. it can be super rigid or it can be loose. The point is it has to feel to you like it's not controlling, like it's mm -hmm. not – You're not. if you try to manipulate yourself, it has the same effect as someone trying to manipulate – other someone else trying to manipulate you. Yeah. You have to be open to that structure changing because even in – uh, a teaching intervention, you have to be able to take the structure slowly away, and that's scaffolding. Mm -hmm. You gotta be able to do it for yourself. If you tr make lots of checklists and they drive you nuts, stop making them. Think about what mm -hmm. you like about the checklist, and then just do that part. If wow. you, if something is not working, it's not your fault. It's its fault. Change it. Yeah. Well, and I think just having the awareness that you can change it, that you're just not stuck with this structure, stuck with X, Y, Z, that you, yeah, I just love that. And I love, you know, so, so many things, some of the highlights just so far, of just, you know, having that space of no judgment. Mm -hmm. That's key. Um, deep, yeah, deep listening and that there is nothing wrong with you. Like just change mm -hmm. the structure, change the, out, the whatever you're impaling upon yourself of like, yeah. maybe it's the thing. I love when you said like, it's its fault, <laughs> not yours. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, and, and a little trigger that I think is super helpful is if you're feeling frustrated, that's a really great time to take a second and go, what about this is frustrating? What about this do I feel controlled by? And what can I do to give myself a, more autonomy? Mm -hmm. What can I do to give myself a little bit more freedom? Um, and it all starts by saying, I'm not wrong, it is. I'm not wrong, the situation is. And that mm -hmm. place of non-judgment, you have to come at it from that, otherwise – it's just going to feel controlling. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So I want to change gears for a second. Um, mm -hmm. So as a coach and you've, I mean, this, this foundation of coaching that you are really a part of, that you integrate with your clients and with, you know, your website, and like all the things that you're creating, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts about people calling themselves a coach and they're not really a coach? <laughs> Do you have an opinion <laughs> about that? And what um, is a coach? Like what is truly a coach versus not that I want to get into semantics, but I think there's something mm -hmm. really powerful here of someone, you know, you talked about it earlier, like prescriptive mm -hmm. versus deep listening and inquiry. Yeah. I mean, to me, that's a coach is someone is, is someone who walks alongside you to help you figure stuff out mm. and not someone who's dragging you by the nose or someone <laughs> who's claiming to have all the answers. A coach is not a guru. Mm -hmm. And, and I'll say this straight out. If I could not, if I could, if, if at this point everyone didn't already know me as coach Debo, I wouldn't call myself a coach because mm -hmm. of how little coaching I actually do now. It actually, bothers me <laughs> that, yeah. I, that I still go by coach when it's not actually accurate. Um, mm. cause I'm not, I'm doing a lot more making of stuff and a lot less working with people. So mm. it even feels like bullshit for me to say I'm a coach. 
Um, so it bothers me a whole extra lot when someone else says it <laughs> um, <laughs> about themselves. And when what they really want to be is a guru uh, mm-hmm. or what they really want to be is someone who has all the answers. But, yeah. And that is a huge red flag for me when someone is – and it's a red flag for me from personal experience of having accidentally done it – is mm-hmm. selling – uh, a method over principles and selling a system over a mindset or um, not uh, of selling a system instead of saying this is some basic operating principles about how I see the world. I can help teach you those and we can explore the methodologies together mm-hmm. that would fit. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's good coaching. I think that's what a coach is. I don't think a coach is someone selling a system. The best coaches I know, and I've been so lucky to have been mentored by fantastic ones, um, rarely even call themselves that. In fact, my mentor won't let me call him my mentor. He's very mad when I do that. I said, that's calling my friend. Uh Um, And because he doesn't want that power dynamic, because he sees it very much as a, we're learning together. We're doing this together. Uh, And I'm, and he, he, when I asked I, I want to ask if I could come live with him for a couple of weeks and we end up writing a book together. But when he, when he did, he said, I'll, I, I, you can under one condition that when you go, when you leave, you write a letter to me to explaining what you've learned from me. Cause mm-hmm. I'm not, cause I won't know. And that to me yeah. is the, is like, that to me is a coach. That mm-hmm. to me is like the, the, the quintessential relationship of a coach yeah. is, is that, so I don't really don't like when someone is claiming to know everything and then saying, I'm going to tell it to you. That's not a coach. Yeah. That's a messiah. <laughs> like, yeah. Here's the seven yeah. steps just to do this, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So yeah. What, it's fascinating what you're describing is so when I teach the marketing archetypes, there's a guru star archetype, which is very much I know best. Mm-hmm. And then there's the truth guide archetype, which is you know best for you. And my job is to guide you to get to that, pe- that place. Oh, cool. Yeah, I like that. And and so and it's been fascinating though, as I you know, I've studied, you know, gosh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. I personally invested <laughs> in quote coaches mm-hmm. and why I left these relationships very disempowered. And I allowed that. Like I chose that very unconsciously. Yeah. But just studying that, going, how did how the hell did that happen? Like I'm a smart, independent, pretty, pretty strong headed woman. And like, <laughs> how did I get involved in that, to be honest, some of them very abusive relationships? Like, what yeah. is that? Like if it was a boyfriend, it would be totally abusive, but because it's a coach. That I'm paying twenty thousand right. dollars to. You just gave them money. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like it's so fascinating to see this dynamic, but that's just what you're describing of someone who's walking alongside you. Um, what a brilliant example of your friend, mentor, whatever yeah. you prefer yeah. to be called. His name's, like, his name's Dan John. I should. I, I, awesome. I can say who he is. His name's Dan. He actually lives in Salt Lake City. Well, Murray. Oh. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Next door. (laughs) So that's Mm -hmm. fantastic. Awesome. Awesome. Um, So with the whole coaching piece, you know, there's Mm -hmm. another um, thing that I've noticed on your website called motivation science. So is this really like the self-determination theory, like the things you've been talking about, or is it slightly different take? Like what is Um, motivation science? I, 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 full confession, I coined that term. Um, I coined that term because it wasn't, it was a collection of of a couple of theories. And then mm-hmm. interestingly, it was when I got out of grad school, there were three major um, theories that had the most evidence that were, had the most traction and that had the most, there were the best predictive frameworks for helping understand why people do what they do. And mm-hmm. they were self-determination theory, social cognitive theory, and it's a theory called ego depletion. Um, then a fascinating thing happened a couple of years. Uh, well, that's about a year ago now. Uh, ego depletion got, in a lot of hot water when it failed to replicate in large um, randomized pre-registered randomized control trials, which is a mm-hmm. fancy way to say the thing that we thought was happening wasn't actually happening. Oh. And I realized pretty fast that I am, I need to, I can't just refer to the theories because that's a, uh, that's not a, a, the foundation needs to be more flexible than that mm-hmm. because if something fails to replicate, I still need to be able to say, here's what we know. Here's why we know it. But I, I can't say that like this is, you know, ego deplete. I can't say we're uh, instead of motivation science, we're self-determination theory, 
social cognitive <laughs> ego depletion when ego depletion is now out the window. Mm-hmm. So, but, but the core mission of understanding why we do what we do, I had to give that a new name. So we called it motivation science. Mm-hmm. And right now the best theories we have for understanding, again, why people do what they do are, um, social cognitive, uh, self-formation theory, and then a hodgepodge, like a grab bag of, of effects from a number of other places like behavioral economics. Mm-hmm. Um, and we try to get them to all work together, but the reality is there's a lot of schools of thought about why things work and we don't know yet, but that's actually, that's the most fun part for me. I'm a, mm-hmm. my BA is in the history and philosophy of science. So mm-hmm. all that stuff that other people would drive people nuts about <laughs> why isn't there just one theory well, because uh-huh. that's not how science works, and isn't that fun? And everyone goes, no, it's not fun. <laughs> we want but something me, exact and predictable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's not how knowledge works. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's the fun part for me. I think the most the most widely read thing that I've written was a nearly 10,000-word uh, piece on that problem of ego depletion like when it failed to replicate and what it means for coaches what it means when one of the theories that we were basing a lot of our work on Uh, that didn't doesn't the mechanism turns out to not be true or we don't know if it's true or not anymore um to be more specific and i was like there's no i wrote it in a fugue state on a plane (laughs) uh like two, (laughs) two plane flights with with um Omar, uh, our head of research and learning. And I was like, there's no one's going to read this, but we have to write it. Like we're morally bound to write this. We can't do this. And, <laughs> no uh, reader, but we have yeah, to. <laughs> and now is that it's being, you, it was, it was about a half a master's thesis long. Wow. Um, that I wrote in four days. Mm. Uh, it's, it's two of us wrote together and now it's being used it, to teach about the replication crisis in social science and, um, graduate school courses. Mm. So uh, people started emailing me, can I use this for to teach about this problem? And I became wow. an accidental science journalist uh, just because I felt obligated to write about it. So mm. I guess uh, that's my fancy way of saying don't don't prejudge your work. Uh, yeah. And I didn't I, ne- I thought no one would read that because it was so long and so dense. But it's also one of the best things I've ever written. Um, yeah. uh, if you want to read, you can go to habitry dot com slash blog slash willpower. And, uh, it's long, but it's, Mm -hmm. it's fun. And there's an audio recording. I did an audio book of it. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Well, that, you know, it's fascinating because, you know, I'm looking at just like the business coaching industry and the industry that I come from and that I'm a part of, I guess, if you want to call it that, like, I even hate saying coaching industry. I don't even know what that means, but Mm -hmm. this, this dynamic of, you know, when I remember um, going to my coach years ago and saying, okay, something's happening here. Half of my clients are getting results. Half of them aren't. And I'm doing the same thing. Like something's off here Mm -hmm. and it's bothering me that the clients who aren't getting results, like, I'm not sure how to help them. So help me. And she said, you win some, you lose some. It's not your problem. As long as they're willing to pay you, just keep going. And I was oh. like, well, that's kind of shitty. I, feel like <laughs> you know, like, I don't, I don't know. That's a really shitty thing to say and, yeah. and an even shittier thing to be. Um, yeah. and so what, what do you think this dynamic is, especially like in business coaching? Let's just say people who are trying to make money, living their passion, like whatever that definition mm-hmm. is. Why do you think? Some people get results and some people don't. And I know it's not just one thing, but what are some of those possibilities? Um, I think from a coaching standpoint, the thing that's probably happening there, and this is not to say that this is, I think this is just becoming a better coach, is Mm -hmm. as you learn, you you gain that sort of deep pattern learning about what works for some people and what doesn't. And maybe it's conscious and maybe it's not. It's usually not. Mm -hmm. Um, But in learning theory that's called deep pattern recognition, um, and it just feels intuitive, but it's what it is, is noticing, Hey, this worked before this didn't. And it mm-hmm. worked for someone kind of like you. Here's why I think it would work for you again. And maybe you say that out loud. Maybe you don't, but, mm-hmm. um, as you gain more experience and as you gain, learn more about the thing that you're great at as a coach, you start to make better methodology recommendations based mm-hmm. on better and better operating principles. So, your programming, your algorithms are improving, but and so but you're less uh, adherent to systems, to methodologies, to actual like checklists, and mm-hmm. you're more flexible. Mm-hmm. And I can say that with like all of the you know the fancy psychology going on. But the but my favorite examples is when I'm watching my mentor coach, 
Hmm. And he will, uh, he's listening, he's deeply listening to someone. He's got 40 years of experience and he's deeply listening. And then he makes a recommendation that I'm like, the hell is that? You would Hmm. never recommend someone do that. And he goes, yeah, I guess, I guess I just did, didn't I? Because he's seeing something that I'm not because he's real expert Mm -hmm. and he's learning more about the world and what applies to people and not Mm -hmm. Um, the principles haven't changed, but he's getting more open-minded about the methodologies that Mm -hmm. would apply with those principles. Mm -hmm. So I think what's happening from a coaching standpoint is we get better at walking alongside people and not prejudging methodologies. When mm. my my co- my uh, mentor who is an Olympic weightlifter and discus thrower recommends Zumba to someone and without any irony or joke and he's like, "I know, I really think it'd be great for you." And I go, "Oh, well, that surprises me just because I'm got all this tribal stuff." <laughs> Zumba totally works for that. Like I, I'm, I'm, the, I'm learning more as I'm watching mm-hmm. doing it. On the mm-hmm. flip side, uh, what that's like for the client's perspective, as in, okay, that's what I think is going on from a coaching perspective. I think we're just getting better at making, at, at really deeply listening, really mm-hmm. understanding our principles more, and then making more um, uh, suggestions without judgment from mm-hmm. methodologies that we never, from a broader toolkit of methodologies. I think that's what's happening from a coaching standpoint. Yeah. What's happening from a client standpoint, what they're seeing is uh, you're doing a better job of really understanding, of really getting them to think about what it is they want. Mm. That's the hardest, hardest thing to figure out. It's it's universally hard. So asking better questions, figuring out if what they want is actually doable, sustainable, um, and, and, and a priority for them. And mm. then you're doing a better job of one, filtering and I mean that in a good way. Like mm-hmm. if someone's not ready, then that you shouldn't take them on as a client. If someone, yeah. and I mean, I don't mean like if they're not a good, uh, if they're, you know, they're not raring to go. I mean like a good fit for you. And I mean that in a more deep way. I don't just yeah. mean like they can pay you. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing that's happening is you're getting better as a coach at getting them, at getting them to reflect on what it is they really want. I think mm-hmm. those are the two things. From a self determination through perspective, that would be referred to as getting them interested in their own experience, making them mm-hmm. feel like they can get better and that they're, and that you like them. And mm-hmm. as a coach, I think our job is to figure out how to get better at doing that for a broader selection of people and mm-hmm. more deeply within the selection of people that we work with. Yeah. I love that. You know, I just, I actually, I just want you to know, I have three, four pages of notes <laughs> from this <laughs> podcast. So, um, that's not, um, that's not the norm. So this is really, really amazing information because I can feel that your, you know, if you say it this way, like your heart of like your whole mission is to help people be better humans. Mm. And yeah. I love your, you know, help people be better friends, bosses mm-hmm. and humans. And it's like, it could really just be that simple and it's not a small feat like it's not a small mission you know but when you said you know um get people to think about what what it is that they really want and is it doable sustainable and is it a priority mm-hmm. like it, yeah i think sometimes i know i forget that and so those would be really great questions if something's not changing for me or not happening in my business or in my you know health or weight loss or whatever it is it's like well is this doable is it sustainable and is this a priority and be honest with myself and for people to be honest, like, yeah, if it's not a priority, then why would you beat yourself up? And how, if it really is important to you, then what gets to shift? So it is a priority if mm-hmm. it's truly something you want. So when you see people and we just have, you know, another two minutes before we wrap up. Um, so maybe very quickly when something like when someone says, yes, I want X, but it's not a priority. Mm-hmm. Then how do they bridge that gap? Um, um, ask why it's not and what else is. Mm. Um, one of the tools that I like to use is, uh, asking people what a better version of themselves would be. Um, or, or if that, if that's a bridge too far, asking about other people in their life that they look up to, um, Mm. if they can't actually picture themselves being better and to ask about the qualities that that person has and how, what are some ways that we can improve those qualities? Mm. Right. Get a little bit, get a little bit better. I call it better-ish. 
better yeah. ish. At those <laughs> I things. love that. Um, mm-hmm. And just start closing the gaps, just mm-hmm. in whatever way you can. Because even if doing that thing isn't a priority, what is it about that thing that was attractive to you? What mm-hmm. what is the who who is the person that you thought you would be if you did that? Is mm-hmm. there some other way that you can get closer to that? That isn't that thing. If for mm-hmm. if you if if maybe it's not running a marathon, maybe it's just going to the gym consistently. Maybe it's walking every day. But whatever it is, if if that thing is the thing you want to do, look at about it about what it is that you liked about it. Who the person that you would be, who who is the person that you would be if you did those, and start mm-hmm. working on the qualities and the habits and the skills that that person has. Amazing. So I just want to reiterate something you said is who's the person you thought you would be if you did that? Mm -hmm. And how can you how else can you have that if like that's not the path? Mm -hmm. So this has been absolutely brilliant. I'm so grateful. Thank you so much for your expertise, your knowledge, the conversation and the work that you're doing. Like I I can't wait to explore this even more. And so if you'd like to connect with Steve-O, then when you go to AngelaJohnson.com again, that's a double L AngelaJohnson.com forward slash podcast. Um, within the next 24 hours, you'll actually see this interview and a connection to his website. And any final words of wisdom you'd like to share before we wrap up today? Um, have fun. <laughs> I really think that that's most of motivation is finding things that are fun and doing them. Yeah. Oh, I, I absolutely agree. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you again, steve Thank you for joining me on another episode of Business Alchemy. See you guys next week. This is Angela Johnson signing off for now. Bye, everybody. <laughs> been listening to Angela Johnson on the Business Alchemy Show. Be sure to get free resources and news on the upcoming events that will change your money and business at AngelaJohnson.com. That's AngelaJohnson.com.